Great. So, right. I'd like to thank uh, Luke and Gian Maria for organizing this uh, wonderful workshop and for giving me an opportunity to present this work. Uh, the, uh, the, this talk is a departure from uh, the main topic of the workshop, which is Bergman projections. So we, we should very much view it as part of the related topics segment. So I'll be talking about holomorphic Hardy spaces. And in fact, uh, the main focus of this talk is to propose a, a scheme for producing new holomorphic Hardy spaces from pre-existing Hardy space structures. So uh, all of this is joint work with Anna Catherine Gallagher, Loredana Lanzani, and Les Vivas. And you can find our results in a paper that appeared in MADC earlier this year. So before I delve into the construction, uh, there was a certain phenomenon that we stumbled upon when, uh, which led us to this construction. So I want to tell you, uh, you know, the story of that. How, how did we stumble upon this uh, phenomenon? So at the time, we were looking at the Hartox Triangle, which is an object that everybody is very familiar with. This has already made many appearances in this conference. And of course, it has re received an extensive amount of attention, especially from the point of view of Bergman spaces and the debar problem. And uh, you know, this is by no means a complete list of names. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we noticed that in, uh, in this extensive literature, we didn't see any mention of a boundary integral representation formula for the Hartox Triangle. Now it turns out that if you sort of do what one does on the byte disk, then it is not actually difficult to come up with a, uh, a Cauchy integral representation formula on the Hartox triangle. And this is what we obtained. So this uh, formula here, it is valid for functions that are holomorphic on the Hartox triangle and continuous all the way up to the full boundary of the Hartox triangle. So the, for the purpose of this slide, I will refer to that class of functions as the triangle algebra. And another feature to note is that the integration is taking place over what is sometimes referred to as the distinguished boundary of the Hartox triangle, which is a two-dimensional torus. So when there is a boundary integral representation formula like this, there is usually some sort of a Hardy space lurking around. So how can one try to find that Hardy space? So here's a strategy. You use the right-hand side of this formula as a recipe for an operator. So I will denote this by uh, this operator by capital K, and uh, it is not hard to check that capital K F is actually well defined even when F is just an L two function on the distinguished boundary. And here I'm taking the standard product measure on T. So capital K takes an L two function on T to a holomorphic function on H. And then if we want to come back to L two of T, we do the standard trick of trying to take boundary values approaching points in the distinguished boundary. Now, because everything is very explicit over here, one can check by hand that this entire sequence of operations is well-defined. And ultimately what I get, uh, I denote that operator by bold C. Now bold C is supposed to remind you of the Cauchy projection for planar domains. And just as with the Cauchy projection for planar domains, this bold C turns out to be a projection operator from L2 of T to L2 of T. Now, in the case of planar domains, the range of the Cauchy projection is exactly the uh, classical Hardy space of the domain. And so taking motivation from that, we may be tempted to define the ha uh, Hardy space of the Hartox triangle as the range of this operator. Now, if this is not a convincing enough re reason, it turns out that this projection map is actually an orthogonal projection. And there is another way of getting to the space, which is uh, very relevant for the purpose of this talk. The space is also the L2 closure of the restriction of the triangle algebra to the distinguished boundary. So around the time we made these observations and convinced ourselves that this is the Hardy space for the Hartox triangle, a preprint came along on the archive. And this preprint was due to Monguzi. And this was the first time we saw anybody discuss a hardy space for the uh, Hartox triangle, uh, considerations were different. And it turns out that his space that uh, he got was also different. Now, both his space and our space can be expressed in terms of uh, Fourier series expansion, so they can be compared. And what we observed was that our spaces basically uh, differ by a shift operator. So the construction I'm going to discuss is going to explain this discrepancy. And we are going to realize that this is not an anomaly in this situation. This is actually a feature of these domains. But before we get there, this kind of raises a more important question. What is a Hardy space? What is one allowed to call a Hardy space? So the problem of studying uh, Hardy spaces as compared to Bergman spaces is that there is no canonical definition for a Hardy space. 
which is reflected in the fact that the theory of Hardy spaces is uh, somewhat fragmented. And because this is an audience of experts, I'm not going to spend, uh, you know, not give a very detailed overview, but here are some classes for which Hardy spaces have been studied. So of course the study started on the disk, it was then extended to planar domains, then inspired from what was happening on the unit disk and the upper half plane, uh, Hardy spaces were constructed for classical domains in CN where some very explicit formulas were obtained. There is a unified theory for C2 smooth bounded domains in CN, uh, where there is now a lot of experimentation about choice of boundary measure and things like that. And then more recently, there's a very comprehensive treatment of Hardy spaces on hyper convex domains in CN. And the reason I call this comprehensive is because this construction actually subsumes many of these older constructions of Hardy spaces. So something I should say at this stage is that these uh, so-called hypersurface deleted domains that we will consider in this talk, they're not hyperconvex domains. So they don't actually fit into this regime of uh, Poletsky's testing. All right, so it's worth discussing what are some of the ways in which people come up with Hardy spaces. So a very common approach is that you take an exhaustion of your domain, and then you consider those holomorphic functions that have some restricted growth condition uh, along the boundaries of these exhausting domains. Another way to come up with a Hardy space is that you consider a class of holomorphic functions uh, on the domain that have some boundary values. And then you take the L2 limits of those boundary values with respect to some choice of measure on the boundary. And the third one that I have over here, this is not as much as a definition. It is much, it turns out to be a feature of Hardy spaces that they also turn out to be the range. You know, sometimes they are the range of a projection operator as we had seen on the first slide. So uh, when, when you are trying to come up with Hardy spaces, you have to fix a point of view. And we decided to stick to the second point of view over here because this allows us to not know too much about the geometry of the domain. Now, uh, however, this particular uh, uh, type of definition has certain disadvantages. So the first one is that uh, when you take L2 limits, uh, then uh, your L2 limits are a priori only defined on the boundary of the domain. Now, whatever may be our perspective, uh, we will agree that uh, our holomorphic Hardy spaces should either consist of holomorphic functions or they should consist of boundary values of holomorphic functions. So these L2 limits that we are getting, how do we associate them to the correct holomorphic functions? And related to this is a second issue that uh, when we talk about Hardy spaces, we want reproducing kernels. That means we want a reproducing kernel Hilbert space on our domain omega, but to have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space on the domain, your function space has to have functions defined on the domain. So in order to uh, kind of bridge this gap, we decided to set a certain ground rule. And so this is our minimum criterion for calling something a Hardy space. So, and it'll turn out that, uh, so, so I'll say a little bit more about this, but so what are we saying here? We're saying that a Hilbert space H of functions defined on the boundary is called a Hardy space, only if the following uh, is satisfied, that you can identify a reproducing kernel Hilbert space of holomorphic functions on omega, which I'll denote by X, such that, first of all, X admits a dense subspace, capital A, that uh, functions in which admit boundary values that lie in H. Secondly, this map on A that carries a function to its boundary value, which I will call the restriction map, this has to be an isometry. So remember both X and H have Hilbert space structures on them. Moreover, this isometry should extend as an isometric isomorphism from the closure of A, which is just X, to the closure of the range of this map, which should be H. Now, any classical Hardy space uh, structure that you know where there are boundary values, uh, it'll turn out that these four features, or these four things that I have colored over here, these are typically there. And typically, if you have an H, X is usually obtained by some sort of exhaustion procedure. In our construction, our focus will be H. And although X will always exist in some abstract form, we may not have a very explicit description for X. All right. So having said all of this, let us now move to a very concrete example. So I'm going to actually show you our construction for a very specific example in the plane and then move to the more general setting. But to do that very specific example, I'm going to very quickly revisit the case of the unit disk, which I know everybody is very familiar with, but it's worth going over this. So there are multiple ways of coming up with the same Hardy space on the disk. Uh, one is that you have these um, you know, L2 averages over concentric circles. So I'll denote this by capital H2. 
One can also take the L2 closure of the restriction of the disk algebra to the boundary of the disk. This I will denote by small h2. And there is a very easy way of going between the two, which is that you take the coefficients of power series to Fourier series coefficients. And just to do a reality check over here against the minimum criterion that I just laid down in the previous slide, all the ingredients of the minimum criterion are present in this slide. So we have the space from the inside, we have the boundary space, we have the dense subspace, and we have the isometric isomorphism. And it is worth mentioning here, since we are interested in boundary integral representation formulas, it is very easy to obtain the psychokernel. In fact, among simply connected domains in the plane, the disk is unique in that you basic, the Cauchy kernel essentially gives you the psychokernel. So you just need to write it with respect to the appropriate measure and you'll get the psychokernel. So uh, given that this is happening on the unit disk, uh, I think it's a very natural thing to ask, what happens if you puncture the disk at a point? Now, this is not an arbitrary example. Since we were interested in the Hartox triangle, which is uh, biholomorphic to disk cross disk star, uh, it is kind of natural to ask what is happening on disk star. However, we didn't see any discussion in the literature about Hardy spaces for punctured domains. Uh, I did attend a talk by Ken Kennig recently, who talks about harmonic Bergman spaces on punctured domains. However, for Hardy spaces, we had to start from scratch. So since we are taking this boundary-based approach, uh, the question is, what is our choice of capital A over here? So I'm going to run you through some natural choices, uh, which might also explain why these spaces have not been considered before. So a sort of natural choice, uh, is there a question here? Ah, all right. So a sort of natural choice over here is that you image what one does for um, the disk, which is that you take functions that are holomorphic in the domain, and they're continuous all the way up to the, they're continuous on the closure of the domain. So as soon as you take the closure, the puncture vanishes. And so uh, what you get back is just the disk algebra. So you're not going, so you can settle for this, it's fine, but you're not going to get anything new. So the puncture doesn't really appear in this discussion. Um, so one thing I should mention here that we have made a choice of measure and our choice of measure is the standard arc length measure on the boundary of the disk. So based on that, there is another uh, thing one could try to do, which is almost the opposite extreme, which is that you take functions that are holomorphic in D star, but you only ask for continuity all the way up to the support of the measure. All right. So now, uh, this is definitely uh, much larger than the disk algebra, but there is a fundamental problem over here, which is that point evaluations, which are key to getting a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, point evaluation functionals, functionals are not bounded. And there is a very clear reason for this due to poles of increasing order. So because we are throwing in everything in here, uh, we can have uh, functions which have poles of uh, as high an order as we want. And this creates a problem with getting our evaluation functionals to be bounded. So what this suggests is that we need to fix the order of the pole, or we need to put an upper bound on the order of the pole. So this leads us to our actual choice for which we have to fix a parameter, and our parameter will be a non-negative integer. So given this parameter k, we will define a k of d star so what we want these to be, we want these to be uh, functions that have poles of order at most k at the origin, but we still want them to have continuous boundary values as you approach the unit circle. So first I'll write a sort of a, a quick way of coming up with this class is all you need to do is you need to shift your disk algebra with a z to the minus k. But this is a rather shoddy way of writing this. So I'll write a better uh, de definition here. So this will consist of all holomorphic functions in D star, such that when I multiply f by z to the k, then this admits an extension in the disk algebra. All right. Now it turns out that if you take uh, this class, then point evaluation functionals they tend to be, uh, they, they turn out to be bounded. And I can now define a space using my recipe. So the kth hardy space
Well, Corby, uh, still there? Yeah, I think it's a connection. Was... Well, she's still there. But... Well, the computer, yeah, the computer's still there. She's on a tablet for her voice and on a, uh, the computer. So she can probably hear us. Um, let me send her a message. Uh, okay, no, so there is an audio problem. Yeah, we should send a message because okay. we didn't realize. Uh, Have I lost connection? Uh, yes. Yeah, you, you lost connection, but now we can hear you again. But my uh, my screen probably still needs the screen. screen was, so the screen uh, was shared longer than the audio, but that dropped, that seemed to have dropped out All right. too. All right, uh, I think I can come back. Um, so I can, let me. Sure, sure. All right, so continue. Um, Share screen. Let's try this. So let me know if this is all right. Yep. yep. We just lost, I guess, the the last line. Ah, ah, ah. No, no worries. So I'm going to uh, right. So I'm going to complete what I was saying. So we have this proper uh, this filtration, which is proper at each level, which is going to be a feature uh, later on. And the second thing I would like to note over here is, uh, as I mentioned, that these are reproducing clonal Hilbert spaces. So we can talk about the clonals. And once again, we are in a one can write the eighth level here. Stage. Yeah, we seem to have lost. So, Can you hear us? The same problem. Yeah. I can see her on. I can't hear you, Purvi. Yeah. Let me send a message. No, no, but she, she realized it, I guess. I can see. No. I should be connected again. Yes, now we Okay. Are. Yep. Uh, but this probably still right? I'm sorry about that. All right. My screen visible now? Yep. Yes. Yep. All right, so, um, uh, sorry, I've I become, I become a bit paranoid now. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Excellent. All right, so, so we now want to move to the general setting. So we uh, want to take motivation from this and define our general case. And I want to just make one point over here that what makes all of this work, what makes AKs, these are uh, HK spaces reproducing Conan Hilbert spaces, is that our disk algebra actually had some very nice properties. So that was our starting space. And so we need to extract uh, what are these good properties that the disk algebra has. And we need our starting Hardy space to have those good properties. So I'm going to discuss that. Um, um, and so for that, uh, my setting is as follows. Omega is going to be a domain in CN for the rest of this discussion. Um, mu is a finite Borel measure. Which is supported in the boundary and I'm going to call it support capital T. And here uh, A is just going to be a vector space of functions 
which are defined on omega sub t, which is our notation for omega union, the support of this measure. But we are going to assume two things that when restricted to omega, we get holomorphic functions. And when restricted to the support of the measure, we get L2 new functions. So those are my assumptions on this uh, vector space of functions A. And I'm going to, to define two properties, uh, which are, as I said, uh, they should remind you of the disk algebra. So first say that A is said to be weakly admissible if it satisfies this very familiar looking condition. This condition has appeared before. We saw this at the beginning of Red's talk, for example. So just to go over this, what we are asking is that for any compact subset of omega, one can find a constant CK so that uh, the uh, supremum of the absolute value of any function in this family is at most CK times its L2 norm on the support of the measure. And what we know this gives us, it gives us the boundedness of evaluation functionals, but it in fact gives us uniform boundedness on compacts. So what happens over here, what we get over here is the following, that if I consider the following map, which takes a function defined on the support of the measure, and it takes us to a function defined on the interior, and how is it defined? You map uh, Z, so you basically want to evaluate F at Z. Uh, so a priori, this is only defined for F coming from uh, A, but this condition of weak extendability is us that this extends as a map from, so weak admissibility tells us that this extends to the L2 closure of A, which we will denote by H onto, so now you land in to sub, uh, some subspace of holomorphic functions in omega. Okay, so this H and X is supposed to remind you of the minimum criterion. So we are starting with this boundary space. We want to identify it with some space in the interior. That is what this X represents. However, we want this map to be in, uh, an isomorphism. So what do we need for injectivity? We are not guaranteed injectivity with mere weak admissibility. So to get injectivity, uh, what we need is what we call strong admissibility over here. It is a somewhat so Purvi, Purvi, sorry to interrupt you. Can you hear me? I'll message her again. Sorry, no, I, I now the thing is going on, but as some participants suggested, maybe it's a good idea if you turn off your video on the other device. So that could be uh, maybe the connection because from time to time it gets slower and we can't hear your voice. Maybe she can't hear us. Um, yeah, probably. Um, I sh okay, now we can, okay, now we yeah, can I'm hear. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to share the screen again. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Can you try to... to... Could you maybe disable the video yeah. on the yeah. other device that might... Uh... Yeah, I think that might help. So I'm just going to exit yeah. that. Um, okay. I'm just going to exit that actually. Okay. I'm really sorry about this. No problem. Okay. And I'm going to try sharing my screen again. So I'm. Uh, so am I still audible? Yes. 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 All right. Great. So um, let's see what's going on here. So we can we can see it now. How about now? Is this good? Yes. All right. 
All right. So, uh, right. So, so the point is that these weak and strong admissibility conditions, these are precisely what are needed to identify this edge space with a space defined on omega. So I just want to make a comment over here that um, uh, there are, uh, so we, the, the second choice that we made for D star, choice two for D star is not weakly admissible. That was the case where we did not have bounded evaluation functionals. And uh, something that we don't know, and we would very much like to know the answer to, is uh, are there examples uh, where you have weak admissibility, but not strong admissibility? Example of A, uh, that is um, weakly, but not strongly admissible. All right, so uh, with this framework uh, uh, in place, uh, we are now ready to start our uh, construction. So I need to tell you the ingredients. And for that, we will start with this pair omega nu, uh, where once again, omega is a domain in CN. Nu is a finite Borel measure supported somewhere in the boundary, and we denote capital P by the support of nu. And what we want for from this pair is that if we look at A omega nu, which is the space of holomorphic functions on omega that is continuous up to the support of the measure, we want this space to be strongly admissible. So many of the classical Hardy spaces that we know, uh, they do fit into this uh, regime. So you can take your favorite Hardy space and that can be uh, that can give you the parent space. So in the, uh, for the rest of this talk, I will uh, refer to this as the parent, parent space algebra. And um, so my starting Hardy space of the parent space is um, once again, we do the same thing. We restrict it to the support and we take its L2 closure in you. So this is going to be my starting Hardy space. Now, uh, what we want to do is we want to create a new domain, which is my hypersurface deleted domain for which I need to remove uh, an analytic hypersurface from Omega. Um, so I can't actually see the screen. Uh, am I still connected? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, all right, uh, so I, I'm going to keep checking because I can't actually see anything. So. Uh, all right, so we're going to remove an analytic hypersurface and this hypersurface is going to be defined uh, on an open set containing omega closure. And when you have a hypersurface like that, then its intersection with omega closure is a finite union of irreducible components. Now we want a little bit more from these individual components. We want them to be minimally defined. So let me explain what that means over here. So for the purpose of this discussion, let's just assume there is only one component so in order for V to be minimally defined, what it needs to be, first of all, it needs to be a principal variety, which means that there is a global defining function uh, such that V is the zero set of P on omega closure. So this is just saying that it is principal. But minimal is, uh, in addition to this, we, we need that for any open subset of omega closure if there is a holomorphic function in u that vanishes on v then phi divides g in o of u all right so uh, in this case so if we have both these conditions then i'll call phi uh, a minimal defining function of V and I'll denote it by MDF. So for example, when we saw the punctured disc, the origin uh, is an analytic variety in C, uh, phi of Z equal to Z is a defining function. Uh, it is a minimal defining function. On the other hand, phi of Z equal to Z square is not a minimal defining function. So we need these minimal defining functions. We, we can do this construction even in the absence of minimal defining functions, but then there are some issues with this construction. First of all, it will depend on the defining function and there will be some loss of data. So this minimal defining function makes this construction nice. 
Now, what about the interaction between uh, the measure and the variety? So the variety can intersect the support of the measure. However, it must do so in a measure zero set. And this will play an important role later on. So finally, our hypersurface deleted domain will be omega star, which is just omega with this variety removed. And I should make a, a couple of comments. So if you start with something pseudo-convex, then this hypersurface deleted domain uh, is pseudo-convex. As I mentioned earlier, it is not hyperconvex. Uh, so we don't already have constructions of Hardy spaces for these. Uh, let me pause, uh, see if there are any questions and make sure that I'm still connected. You are connected. <laughs> All right, so uh, so before we carry on with the construction, so we have this triplet of omega, nu, and v. So let us convince ourselves that there are plenty of examples out there for us to work with. And then I will talk about the construction. So in the planar case, one is taking a domain in C. Uh, we want to take the arc length measure on the boundary. And to get the strong admissibility condition, if I assume a certain amount of regularity, like let's say our domain is C1 alpha, then uh, I do have strong admissibility. So omega comma nu is a parent space. Now, what can these? Uh, uh, what are these uh, things that we are going to delete? In the planar case, uh, they have to be a finite collection of points. So hypersurface deleted domains in the plane are basically uh, planes with finitely many punctures. Now, in higher dimensions, uh, I'll give you two points of view. So one is, so remember that there is this non-trivial condition on capital D. So you start with your fav favorite parent space, and there are many examples. So you could take C2 smooth functions with the standard Euclidean surface area on the boundary. Uh, that will be a parent space. You could take a polydisc with the standard measure on the distinguished boundary. Uh, the, that pair also has strong admissibility. So these are various choices uh, of parent spaces. And in general, it may be hard to determine when a capital D is minimally defined, but there is one example which we definitely know is minimally defined, and that is uh, the example of complex lines. So, uh, so to construct hypersurface deleted domains, you can take your uh, you know, favorite parent space and delete a finite union of lines from that. That is an example. However, if you uh, want to delete other varieties and you don't want to worry too much about whether or not they're minimally defined, then there are certain conditions on the domain that you can put so that you're guaranteed that any analytic hypersurface is a, a union of irreducible minimally defined components. So I have placed that condition in, in row three over here. Uh, these conditions are partly topological, partly analytic, and what they really amount to is that you can solve a certain Kuzan 2 problem on omega closure. And so if you start with something like that, you take a measure on the boundary so that the algebra of this parent space is strongly admissible, then you can remove any analytic hypersurface. It will be um, a union of uh, irreducible minimally defined. So, excuse me, poor way. So yes. you mean finite union of complex lines in any dimension. So these are not complex hypersurface, uh, complex hyper. Oh, no. uh, oh, 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 good point. Uh, so I was, uh, no, no, you're absolutely right. These are hypersurfaces. I'm sorry. So I think I was uh, thinking far too much. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, yes. Uh, so of course, because we will do examples in C2, they will be lines. Uh, this is not about lower dimensional varieties. Um, that's something we haven't thought about. They have to be a uh, co-dimension one. All right, so um, just to uh, put things into perspective, so D star is an example in the first row. Um, the second row, something that we will look at later, D cross D star or D star cross D star, uh, you know, just to add some examples in there. They're, these are going to be hypersurface deleted domains. All right, so now let's move on to the actual construction uh, for these hypersurface deleted domains. So for this, we will fix a, a minimal defining function uh, however, our final construction will not depend on the choice. And we will fix a parameter k, which is a non-negative integer. And for this, we will define our ak omega star nu to be precisely those functions which have a singularity along v of order up to k. So here's, another, here's once more a shoddy way of defining this in that I take my algebra of the parent space and I shift it by phi to the minus k. Now, unlike the case of the disk, the problem here is that when you take boundary values of this, then that may not give you L2 functions, uh, L2 with respect to new. And the reason for that is that your variety is now allowed to intersect the boundary. 
So what we need to do at this stage is to intersect this with L2 here. So this is the minor modif this is a modification from the case of D star, uh, but I will give you a better way of representing this space. So this is a better definition. You take those holomorphic functions on omega star that are continuous all the way up to the support of the measure, except uh, you know except along V. Uh, phi to the k times f has to land in the original algebra, and we need the ad additional condition that these capital F's when restricted to t are in the L two space. So now that we have this, if we want to now construct Hardy spaces out of these, remember we need this strong admissibility condition. And our main result is that strong admissibility of the parent space percolates down to these spaces. So if your parent space has a strongly admissible algebra, then each of these AKs turn out to be strongly admissible. So now when you do this procedure of restricting to the support of the measure, taking the L2 closure, what you get are reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Now, something I should mention over here is that I assumed in this construction that I only have one component. That's why I have m equal to one. That keeps things simple. If you want to do this for the case where you have finitely many components, then you iterate this process and you will get an entire lattice worth of uh, these spaces. Okay, but for, for the sake of you know, discussion, it's easier to keep things uh, simple and assume that there is only one component. All right, so let me check uh, you know, that I'm still connected and that there are, uh, if there are any questions, I can address them. You're still connected. All right, great. All right, so, uh, so what are some uh, properties of these spaces? So we saw this earlier that at the zeroth stage, you don't get anything new. You just get back the Hardy space of your parent space. You then get a filtration uh, induced by just inclusion maps. You also get a, a descending filtration uh, via multiplication by this phi map. And as I said earlier, the actual construction finally does not depend on phi. Uh, now, uh, in general, we can't say uh, much about these filtrations. However, if you're in the special case where your variety does not intersect the support of the measure at all, then the ascending filtration is strict as we saw in the case of the star but the descending filtration stabilizes at the very beginning, which means that you have, I'm sorry, you have isomorphisms between these spaces via multiplication by this phi map. All right, now in the classical Hardy space setup, the dense uh, space that you take is usually an algebra and its closure is a module over that algebra. In general, that is a hard, uh, you know, we don't recover that structure, but in this special setting where the variety does not intersect the support, uh, these AKs, the union of these AKs form what is known as a filtered algebra, and the union of these HKs uh, form what is known as a filtered module over this filtered algebra. So there is, in this setting where there is no intersection between the variety and the, measure, the support of the measure, you do recover some good algebraic properties. Uh, so let me say a little bit more about this filtration. So the case of B star uh, can be misleading because we have examples where this filtration can stab uh, stabilize. And so for that, I will discuss the example of egg domains. This is also a good excuse to discuss some examples. So here we have a family of egg domains. In the case B equal to one, this is just the unit ball. And we will consider uh, two uh, choices of measures. One will be the standard surface area measure. And here the Hardy space will just turn out to be the classical Hardy space. So right now I have not deleted any varieties, okay? So this is just at the level of the parent space. Another choice is to take a Montjampier measure with respect to a specific exhaustion function. And this was actually a choice that was considered by Hansen. So he studied Hardy spaces corresponding to this choice of measure. This space turns out to be the boundary value space of a uh, construction considered by Poletsky and Stesson that I had referred to earlier. And it was Sahin who observed that, you know, Hansen spaces are the boundary value spaces for the Poletsky Stesson spaces. So these are two distinct choices of measure. For the ball, they are equivalent. However, uh, for p greater than one, uh, the space with respect to omega is genuinely larger. Now we are going to delete a, a, a line over here. We are going to delete the Z1 axis. And what we observe is that when we delete the Z1 axis and run our procedure through it, then if our choice is the surface area measure, then we absolutely don't get anything new. Uh, the whole construction stabilizes at the very first stage. So you don't see any new spaces. However, if you take this Montjampier measure, 
then you do get a non-trivial filtration up to the P minus first stage, and then the filtration stabilizes. The descending filtration never stabilizes. Okay, uh, what uh, so we see this dual uh, thing going on that some your ascend when your ascending filtration does not stabilize, your descending filtration stabilizes. Uh, and here the opposite is happening. And something that we haven't uh, really uh, found is an example where maybe neither of the two filtrations stabilize. Um, so that's some que a question to think about. Now I want to make um, a, 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 some comments over here about a case that we will not um, cover in full detail, but I want to mention that these omega P's, they converge to D cross D in the Hostoff metric the by disk. And so the same is going to happen when you delete the Z1 axis from these domains. Now, if I uh, index these measures, then sigma P does converge to the full uh, surface area measure on the boundary of the by disk. Uh, so this is a weak star limit. On the other hand, these non damping uh, is there a? No problem, it was background noise, sorry. Oh. No, no problem. Yeah. So the Mont-Jampier measures, these converge to the standard measure supported on the distinguished boundary. So this discussion tells us that on D cross D star, which I will not cover in any detail, if you take this choice of measure, you should not expect anything in the filtration, just as with these egg domains. Uh, that is why it is somehow more natural, and that, that happens with the by disk as well, to consider this measure supported on the distinguished boundary, because there then the filtration yields something interesting. All right. So, uh, so we discussed these properties that these spaces inherit, uh, but I want to now tell you about something where the inheritance is not that clear. Okay. So uh, since we were interested in boundary integral representation formulas, we should talk about kernels. So here, omega nu will be a parent space, capital P will be the support of nu, and we will call a function on omega cross P, a, a kernel with reproducing property for H2. If for functions in the dense, in the parent space algebra, so this is a dense subspace, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the values of the functions in the interior can be recovered by integrating the function against Q on the support of the measure. We have many examples of such. So the Cauchy kernel for planar domains is one such example. Uh, any Hardy space, as long as you're starting with a strongly admissible algebra, your Hardy space is always guaranteed one choice of this kernel, which is the Seco kernel. In fact, it is the unique kernel with re reproducing property, which has the additional feature that uh, when you take its conjugate and view it as a function in the second variable, it itself is in the Hardy space. So one may think that starting with the psycho kernel of the parent space, you may be able to produce psycho kernels for these new HK spaces. So let me tell you what we were able to say. So in this discussion, phi will be a, a minimal defining function of our variety. I will take a function in the parent algebra, which is non-vanishing everywhere except along capital B. And I'll set up this new function psi h times phi. So I want you to think of psi as a new defining function for capital B, but it may no longer be a minimal defining function. Okay. And uh, what we observed is that if you start with a kernel with reproducing property for the parent space, then you can cook up kernels with reproducing properties for these HK spaces using the following formula. And you will notice that this has a lot of resemblance to what was happening for the Seco kernels of the punctured disk. So it was Seco kernel of the disk times this uh, function raised to the power k. Now, if we take Q to be the Seco kernel, do these QKs turn out to be the Seco kernels of the uh, new Hardy spaces? Uh, not always, we, uh, we don't know. We needed some very special conditions on this psi uh, function for, to, for, to, uh, to make this happen. So what was the special condition on the psi function that one needed? So we first of all need that this factor H is now nowhere vanishing on omega t. And secondly, we want that the absolute value of psi is a constant on the support of the measure. So this may seem a bit uh, much, uh, like it may seem uh, technical, but what this, uh, for instance, implies is that the support of the measure and the variety, so they do not intersect. 
So that means our uh, this, this second part is somewhat special to this setting. And not only do we need this intersection to be empty, we are looking for a very special function psi. And we'll see on the next slide, you know, how can we come up with this function psi? However, if we do have such a function, then the above recipe, if you take Q to be the psycho kernel of the parent space, these QKs do turn out to be the psycho kernels of these new HK spaces. Okay, so um, so as I said, that it is worth uh, running this machine, uh, you know, sort of testing this on certain examples. So um, let me uh, uh, maybe let me ask, how much time do I have? I think you uh, probably about three minutes or so, but you could, because of the difficulties, you know, maybe you could you could go a, a few minutes longer because we built ten minutes of questions in so. Um, all right, all right. Uh, thanks a lot. But I'll uh, so I'll try to um, not go over time. Let me just uh, maybe say something in the case of planar domains, and then I, I'll make it a point to return to the hot dogs triangle because that's where we started. So, um, so for planar domains, I will sort of test this result uh, for certain um, examples. So here uh, I have certain assumptions that we saw earlier for planar domains, and I'll only remove one point. So again, for the sake of simplicity, I will only make one puncture. And this condition that gives us these new psycho kernels, what does it reduce to? So one is looking for a psi in the uh, in a omega that has a simple pole at p, and it is unimodular on the boundary. So in some sense, one is looking for this very strong inner function. So if of course omega is the unit disk and p is an arbitrary point in the unit disk, you can take a Blaschke factor. So this is one situation in which you can apply the previous result. In fact, if you take any simply connected domain, you can always take a Riemann map as a choice of psi, as long as the Riemann map maps the puncture to the origin. Uh, this is something that I want to point out that if you take your planar domain to be an annulus, then it turns out that you can't come up with such a psi. So uh, this is a curiosity because of course, these punctured annuli do have zego kernels by abstract reasoning, uh, but we don't know the connection of these zego kernels to the zego kernel of the original annulus. Uh, at least it doesn't come through this result. So um, since I don't want to uh, maybe uh, go over time too much, we also have some sort of a rigidity result, but I will leave that later. I think I can hear some background noise. Uh, at least tells me that I'm still connected. Yeah, All there right. were some bells ringing somewhere, I guess. Um, but uh, go, go ahead. Is that a sign? I, I'm not sure. Okay. So, uh, all right. So I'll skip this particular rigidity lemma uh, and I'll come back to the setting of the hot dog triangle because that's where we started. Um, and so the key thing is that the hot dog triangle is actually not a hypersurface deleted domain. However, it is the biholomorphic image of one. So we can, uh, and it, uh, we can push this entire construction forward and we do get a filtration of Hardy spaces for the hot dogs triangle, we can write it very explicitly in terms of Fourier expansions. We can compute the psycho kernels, and the psycho kernel should remind you of the Cauchy integral formula that we saw on the very first slide. Uh, I should say over here that uh, the on the first slide, I mentioned that we uh, cooked up something that was H0. Uh, Munguzi space is H1, and so we then have a filtration going after that. And um, something similar can be done for these variants of these hot dogs triangles that were studied, but first studied by uh, Luke Edholm and Jeff McNeil. Uh, the formulas, of course, get increasingly complicated, uh, but they can be obtained. I should mention that, uh, you know, uh, this was already observed by Munguzi in his paper for his Hardy space, that the associated psycho projector uh, pro projection is just a Fourier multiplication operator. So the LP regularity is straightforward. That is also the case with these. Uh, uh, the full filtration. So the, you always get these LP uh, regularity results for the single projection. So uh, let me uh, just go a minute over time um, and maybe end with a, a few questions. Um, so I, the first question, I mean, there are many things that you can ask in terms of inheritance, but maybe from the point of view of this workshop, one may be interested in knowing that if you, if you assume that you have good regularity properties for the psycho projection of the parent space, is that inherited by these HK spaces? Now, we did not have a very good formula uh, relating the psycho kernels of these new spaces with the parent space. However, here is a heuristic, and this can be obtained from that result about kernels with reproducing properties. 
So here, bold S presents the Zego projection of the parent. <laughs> And S1 represents the Zego projection of the, the next space in the filtration. Then there is a relationship between them via certain multiplication operators. Okay. And so the square bracket here is a commutator. It is a relatively complicated expression. You can possibly make it simpler by assuming certain things on the domain. But can such an expression allow us to get regularity properties for S1 if we assume regularity properties for S? Uh, a more general question, we had to assume that our capital V was minimally defined. For analytic hyper hypersurfaces, local minimal defining functions are always guaranteed. So can we extend this construction to the case where your variety is not necessarily globally defined? That would be excellent because that would take away uh, you know, all these complications. And finally, from the point of view of the example we started with, can we somehow expand this class of examples to, in, you know, to have a general class that covers the Hartog's triangle and its variance? And preferably, we would like this class to be biholomorphically invariant because currently hypersurface deleted domains uh, with all these extra conditions are, are not necessarily uh, bi uh, biholomorphically invariant. Uh, so I will end over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about all the technical difficulties, uh, but thank you for your attention.